Okay, <coughs> so we can uh, start uh, our topic is uh, mode of action of uh, pesticides and as I have said uh, we cannot actually cover all of these pesticides uh, on the mode of action. So we are going to use uh, some examples so that you can understand uh, what we mean by mode of action of uh, pesticides. The mode of action is actually the biochemical and physiological processes that lead to the destruction of the pest. So if we apply a pesticide targeting the pest, inside the pest uh, going, we are going to trigger some uh, reactions which are biochemical and the physiological processes. This then could lead to the death of this uh, pest. So we are going to look at such uh, reactions and we are going to focus on organophosphates, carbamates, organochlorines, pyrethroids and the triazines. Uh, during this uh, course of discussion it's unavoidable to use uh, the chemical structures, but don't worry much about them. Just focus on the concept. So we are going to start with organophosphates. These pesticides are widely used to control insect pests. They tended to replace organochlorines because of the persistence problems and the pollution of uh, DDT. Uh, DDT is an uh, organochlorine and these tend to last in the environment for a long time. So people had to switch to organophosphates. Frequent sprays are necessary during the course of growing season if you are using uh, organophosphates because they tend to disappear uh, within the environment. Uh, organophosphates are very effective on uh, aphids. This is the basic structure of the organophosphate at the center of the molecule we have got the phosphorus. And phosphorus is attached to what you can call RA1O and RA2O. The RA1 and the RA2 are representing the methyl and ethyl, whereas the O is representing uh, oxygen. Where we have Y, uh, we can either have oxygen or sulfur. Depending whether we are having oxygen or sulfur, it can change the properties of the organophosphate. Then X represents a specific organic group, uh, which can be complex, but as long as we can remember that structure, uh, it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, we can have this example. Uh, it represents uh, the molecule of the organophosphate. So, on the organophosphates, the two other groups are usually methyl and ethyl, like what I said, and are the same in one molecule. What we mean is this. This should be the same. 
X is a complex aliphatic, it means there are a lot of carbon atoms there, and X is referred to as the living group. It can be P O X or P S X. Uh, o and S representing oxygen and the sulfur respectively. Now we can start with a group known as the orthophosphates. The orthophosphates are represented by that basic uh, structure. You can see on the orthophosphates there is no sulfur. P is surrounded by oxygen uh, molecules. And these oxygen molecules are attached to the R group, which could be ethyl, methyl, and of course we have the X, which represent another other structures. So the basic autophosphates are represented by that structure. We have got examples of uh, insecticides under autophosphates. We have got chlorvenfos, dichlorfos, methenfos, and the phosphamidon. Another structure for the, this organophosphate, we have got the thion phosphates or the phosphothionates. This is the basic structure. If you look at the previous one, the previous one was surrounded by oxygen uh, molecule, uh, atoms, the autophosphates. Moving on to the thionophosphates, we now have a sulfur. This makes thionophosphates. These are the examples, maybe you are familiar with them. Bromophos, diazinon, thionethylene, parathion, these are quite toxic. Then primiphos, and you can have methyl or ethyl uh, uh, groups. Then we have got thiophosphates or phosphothiolates. If I move back a bit, uh, you can see where we are having the position of uh, sulfur. Now you can see where we have sulfur, but we have put a double bond uh, on oxygen. Uh, that is the difference, you know, slight difference. Demeto S methyl, oxy, demeton S methyl, vanido thion. These are the examples. Then the phosphor nets. Now on the phosphonates again you have uh, oxygen surrounding the uh, phosphorus, but you have uh, the X group directly in contact with the phosphorus. Uh, this is what I mean. You can have here, you have got sulfur. But when you have X attached to here, like this one, you have phosphor nets, trichlorphone and butyl net. 
So this is the structure which you should be familiar with. This one is a, a bit complicated pyrophosphoramides. Pyrophosphoramides. Shradan is the example of the organohosate. Now we have enzymes which can attack organophosphates. We have got phosphatases, a, a type of A esterase. Microsomal monoxygenase, which is basically cytochrome P450, or you can simply call it cytochrome P450. Then carboxyl esterase, another enzyme which can attack these uh, organophosphates. We have got a glutathione S RIRO transferase. Also, glutathione is alkyl transferase. <coughs> All of these enzymes uh, can attack organophosphates. Here, we are just showing you uh, some parts. Uh, what we are calling the X group, which is joined to the sulfur now. Uh, we showing with arrows, we can indicate where these enzymes can act. For example, microsomal monoxygenase and the carboxylase esterase. We can act on that. On this one, Microsomal monoxygenase can hit at the hydrogen there, where carboxylamidase can hit at the oxygen there. Now, our interest really is the mode of action of organophosphates. How do they kill the pests, especially the uh, insect, insect. What you should remember is that uh, organophosphates affect the nervous system of an insect. That is their point of action. It is the nervous system. Now, within the nervous system of insects, or even animals, we have an enzyme known as the acetylcholine enzyme, ACHE, which resides within the nerve tissues and the neuromuscular junction, where the nerves touches the muscles, that is the neuromuscular junction. Now what happens is that this enzyme, acetylcholine uh, enzyme, can be attracted to the organophosphate. So it can bind uh, to the organophosphate. And it's a sort of a, a permanent binding. Uh, structure. So the acetyl acetylcholine enzyme will no longer be available. Now the responsibility of acetyl coenzyme uh, acetylcholine enzyme. Sorry about that. Is to destroy the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Now, within the nerves of the insect, we have got acetylcholine. Now, its presence may allow the passage of a signal so that uh, probably the insect can uh, jump or move or fly. 
as a result of these uh, signals, depending on what the insect is responding to. But if we apply the organophosphate, that acetylcholine is now going to be It's, that, that enzyme is now going to combine with the insecticide. As a result, there will be excessive uh, acetylcholine within the nerves. So, the signals will continue to be fired within the insect. If the insect was flying, it's not going to stop flying. It will fly until it dies. Because the signal says it should fly. Because uh, there is nothing to stop uh, that signal. So the enzyme will not be available to destroy acetyl line which holds the signal. This is what uh, this is how the uh, insect can get uh, killed. Here we are just showing you the structure of the nervous system. That is the neuromuscular junction where you have the nerves attached to the muscle fiber and the signal can be transmitted via that uh, uh, nerve. But it is at the end of the nerves where it touches the muscle. That is where we find the acetylcholine. We also find the enzyme acetylcholine uh, enzyme which destroys uh, acetylcholine so that uh, it breaks uh, the signal or message under normal uh, circumstances. But in the presence of the insecticide signals keep on coming so that uh, the insect keeps on repeating uh, some uh, movements which leads to its death. Again, here we have got uh, the structure of these uh, nerves which transmit uh, signals. Maybe you met this when you were doing a biology some time ago, I don't know. Again, this is where you have uh, uh, nerves which are joined. It is the where they join is called the snipe snipeces. Now, it is the snipeces area. This is where we find the activity of acetylcholine enzyme and the acetyl which are responsible for transmitting uh, the message or the signal for the insect to do some, something, either to, to, to run or to fly. But if it comes into contact with the, an organophosphate, it continues to do the action. If it was flying, it will continue to fly. If it was moving, it will continue to move. because of uh, what is happening. Here I have got the three diagrams or three compartments. Uh, you don't have to memorize these compartments. But I am trying to show you where you see those gaps in the first uh, compartment uh, probably to your 
left. It represents a, a normal situation where you have the production of acetylcholine enzyme and the acetylcholine uh, production which transmit the message after transmitting the message then the enzyme destroys uh, acetylcholine which carries the signal and everything is normal if you put in an organo uh, phosphate uh, to the insect, if you apply it, what will happen is that uh, the enzyme is going to combine with the organo phosphate and it's not going to, the enzyme is not going to destroy acetylcholine. So acetylcholine will now uh, accumulate in that space, meaning that uh, the signals will continue to be fired. Uh, later on, on the right, I shall be talking about uh, uh, some other, I think the carbamates, which also act on the acetyl coenzyme A. In this case, they don't necessarily bind, but they compete for acetyl within the within that uh, sniper's uh, space. I, I will talk about it later. Well, here it's a chemical representation of what really happens. If you are interested, you can go through those uh, things. Maybe you will get a better picture. Just try to, to read uh, what is happening there. Here we have simplified the mode of action you can see where we have put a circle to the right of the slide where we are saying organophosphates are ACHE inhibitors or acetylcholine enzyme are inhibitors as a result there is an increase in acetylcholine in the synaptic uh, cleft, uh, the one which is shown at the bottom. Then we have uh, a lot of acetylcholine in that space. Then there is overstimulation after overstimulation, then there is a expression of some uh, symptoms of organophosphate uh, poison. So if you read this uh, slide, probably you can easily remember the mode of action of uh, organophosphates. It's meant to simplify uh, what organophosphates uh, do. This one is uh, illustrating the effect or the impact of phosphate uh, poisoning. It could be to humans. I'm not going to spend the time trying to describe the symptoms which are very clear on this slide. You'll be able to remember them. We move on to carbamates. The carbamates are an interesting uh, group of pesticides. 
they are derived from the carbamic acid. These come from uh, physostigmine, <coughs> which is naturally occurring choline esterase uh, activity. Uh, it is actually present in a plant known as the carabin physiostigma venosa. Uh, this plant is common in West Africa. Actually, it is used traditionally by people in West Africa. Uh, if someone dies, they believe that uh, the person has been bewitched because of this uh, witchcraft, you know, uh, which tend to exist in some uh, communities. But how do they deal with such things? They would use that plant, Calababin, uh, which contains uh, carbamates. So they prepare a concoction uh, which they will give to people, right? If somebody dies after consuming that concoction, they will say that is the person who is actually uh, who is killed. But if somebody vomits and is not affected, then the person is innocent. What a way of doing things. So you will find that uh, normally excessive acetylcholine could actually kill victims because uh, they were they would be administering, you know, a pesticide to somebody. It's like saying, drink a pesticide. If you survive, uh, you are not guilty. If you die, then you are guilty. So this is the brief history of the cabinets. Here we've got the examples. The one which is, you know, uh, common is Cabril, uh, Primicab, Cabofuran. I mean, we, you may have come across this. They originate from the carbamic acid. Uh, we have this several Arud Cab, Oxamil. Metal meal, proper care. I mean, you are some of you are the experts in these uh, pesticides. Some could be nematicides. Uh, maybe you will correct me on that one. Now let us look at the mode of action of the carbamates, more or less similar to the organophosphates, but. Uh, yeah, they, they, they will combine with the acetyl coenzyme A. Uh, sorry, acetyl uh, acetylcholine. I don't know why I'm interested in acetyl coenzyme A. Acety acetylcholine uh, enzyme. But they are going to compete with the acetylcholine. So acetylcholine will compete with the carbamates for the enzyme uh, acetylcholine well, we call it acetylcholine uh, enzyme or, or enzyme ACHE if you want to call it that way. So what happens is that uh, because of this uh, competition, some of the acetylcholine will be free. 
uh, and it is going to be found in the sniper's uh, space. So the excess acetylcholine would cause continuous transmission of messages and this can lead to problems. And remember the mode of action is similar to that of carbamates. Uh, which can uh, release, but carbamates, not, please not, carbamates can release acetylcholine faster than uh, organophosphates. So we may say carbamates are less toxic compared to organophosphates, judging from their mode of action. Uh, with organophosphate, you have a permanent, you know, fixation of acetylcholine. But uh, with the carbamates, carbamates are actually competing uh, with acetylcholine to get hold of that enzyme. And uh, during that process, you know, some of the, and it can be reversible, some of it may become excessive and damage the uh, insect. Here I've got three columns and uh, we are trying to illustrate a scenario which is the first column where we don't have a uh, pesticide. Things are operating uh, normally and we are having another case where we have applied B. Carbamates have been applied and they are now combining with the enzyme causing problems. With the organophosphates, the last column, the combination is almost permanent and you are going to have uh, excessive acetylcholine. So, yeah, we are just trying to compare where we don't have a pesticide, where we have a, those two pesticides applied. But uh, the basic information is that uh, when you have a pesticide, it interferes with the acetyl coenzyme A, uh, which leads to excessive acetylcholine, which leads to the transmission of a continuous signal, which would then lead to the destruction of the insect. So indeed, the carbamates and organophosphates tend to share a more or less similar mode of action. What about organochlorines? These are some of the most widely, I mean, they were most widely used in history. And uh, we have things like DDT, Diludrin, Aldrin, Heptachloridin, Linden, and Toxafid, representing the organochlorines. So these are the structures. Some of them we call them body shape the structure, but anyway, it doesn't, uh, it's not very important. You've got drill drill there, it's one of the most toxic uh, substances. Then DDT, it's an old uh, pesticide. Mode of action, they cause uh, neurotic effects. They can affect uh, the nervous system. The DDT type insecticides act primarily on the peripheral nervous system. They act on the nerve muscle system. They destabilize neutral activity. Sometimes you can have leakage of sodium ions through the nerve membrane. Uh, destabilizing the negative after potential, which is, is the language which is used to describe the transmission of a signal. 
Now, if DGT is present in, in an insect, the insect gets uh, excited. So the, the manifestation is hyper-excitability of nerves and the muscles. And this is what kills the insect. Uh, probably you may need to explore some of these uh, issues. Now, here we can measure the signals. Let's say you don't have a, an insecticide present, uh, the signal is represented at the top. But if the, there's a, an insecticide, you get those series you know, of a lot of peaks which are close together. It means uh, there is a pesticide activity within the insect. Let us talk about the pyrethroids which are obtained from a plant known as Crassanthemum cinariaforia, which is grown in Kenya and uh, Tanzania. The pyrethroids are also synthesized. And the, I mean, they are used to control uh, pests. Uh, these are some of the examples of uh, pyrethroids. Uh, let us talk about the mode of action. The nerve excitation occurs as a result of uh, changes in the nerve membrane permeabilities sodium and potassium ions and therefore any effect of pyrethroids can be interpreted in terms of uh, such permeability. So the presence of uh, a pesticide will affect the membranes of the nervous system, it becomes permeable and this affects the movement of these uh, sodium and potassium ions. And it can affect the electrical uh, changes within the nerves. The result is that we have a rapid knockdown effects. If you are using pyrethroids, you have the neurotoxic action. The effects could resemble those of DDT. They can cause hyper excitation and death. Sodium and potassium conductants are altered when the nerve is poisoned. So the potassium efflux stage of recovery after passage of an impulse lasts much longer in pyrethroid poisoned, poisoned the normal uh, nerve. So the movement of these ions are the sender of the cause of uh, probably death and the excitation within the insect. Again, we can measure the pulses, I mean the, 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 the electrical uh, signals. The first line there representing number of peaks and when the insect is affected, you have uh, the peaks which are close together, meaning that uh, the insect has been affected. So we have got organochlorines and pyrethroids, which may affect, you know, the membranes, which eventually uh, cause 
uh, movement of sodium and the potassium which is not normal it could be calcium and chlorine and organophosphates and the carbamates uh, you know they are affected that space there where you have what we call the snipers of the nervous system it is the excess production of acetylcholine <coughs> Uh, which will give continuous uh, signals that will eventually kill the insect. <coughs> Here we will talk on the triazines, although we have done it before. We will only use triazines is an example of a uh, herbicide in order to talk about the mode of action of uh, herbicides. These are mainly soil applied herbicides but can also be used as post emergent herbicides. Atrazine, which is in this group, is commonly used in maize as a pre emergent uh, herbicide. Ametrine is mainly used as post-emergent herbicide in sugarcane. These herbicides have a potential to be persistent in, so in, in soils. Anyway, these are some of the examples of uh, triazines. Again, examples of uh, triazines. We are not going to unpack these molecules. Uh, what you need to remember about the mode of action of triazines is that uh, they affect the photosynthesis uh, of the plant. If you affect photosynthesis, uh, it means the, the plant is not going to grow because of lack of probably carbohydrates, uh, which are basically manufactured by photosynthesis. But where they affect photosynthesis, it is the photosystem too, if you would still remember it. They are at two points where things can start to go wrong. It's between the primary electron acceptor and the an electron acceptor known as the <coughs> plastopinone. The atrazine will block the movement of electrons at that point. As a result, this can lead to a lot of oxygen, production of peroxides which will actually destroy chloroplast membranes. No wonder why there are these browning effects on the leaves. Also, there is the production of nitrate reductase, which can accumulate nitrites, which also tend to damage the plant. But if you are interested also in the details, but this may be sufficient. You may want to know that uh, the PS2 herbicides inhibit photosynthetic uh, pathway by binding to QB binding site of the D1 protein complex present in the chloroplast thylakoid membrane. Uh, it is the binding which disrupts electron transport system, ETS, from QA to QB, and it can block the fixation of carbon dioxide, ATP generation, and the production of NADPH2. I mean, these are the products of... Uh, 
the light reaction which are affected by uh, this herbicide if you want to, to use that approach. And of course, if you affect the light reaction, you eventually affect also the dark reaction because it uses what comes from the light reaction. There is also oxidation, probably because of our production of peroxides, uh, which can lead to the death of the plant. So these are some of the details, uh, if you are interested in them. But uh, knowing this is, I mean, it's, it's quite sufficient. As long as you know that uh, triads in effect uh, photosynthesis, they can take electrons leading to the death of the plant. So this is photosynthesis between primary electron uh, acceptor and the plastopinone there at the top. That is going to be affected by the triazines. <coughs> and that the whole process is going uh, to collapse. So here is the summary of the mode of action of pesticides we've done, that of organophosphates, carbamates, organochlorines, pyrethroids, and atrazine. Actually, I've tried to simplify this uh, very complex, uh, complicated uh, subject. You can imagine we are dealing with so many pesticides. But at least it, we can have an idea of what they can do uh, to the pest. That is what uh, matters. So this is the end of the first... Uh, so let me stop